Welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery, brought to you by spiritualteachers.org. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. Hi, this is Sean Nevins, and welcome to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. I've got two items to mention before we get started. First, I'm pretty excited to announce that my new book is now available. It's called Hydroglyphics, Reflections on the Sacred, and it's a collaboration with the photographer Phaedra Greenwood. It's really a beautiful, full-color book of photos that's paired with some of my best poetry to date. The photographs are all of water. Sometimes they're reflecting or glimmering or revealing another world in their depths. Sometimes they're mysterious, abstract, and they really brought forth in me a desire to write some, I don't know how else to put it, deep poetry. It sounds like a pun, although I didn't mean it that way. Again, the name is Hydroglyphics. You can get a copy on Amazon or order it from your local bookseller. If you want a signed copy, you can go to spiritualteachers.org and order it directly from me. Click the About button and you'll see a link. The second announcement is that the TAT Foundation is having another virtual event. This one is a two-day workshop on June 13th and 14th, and it's titled Egoless Vector. So what does that mean? Well, I thought I'd just quickly read the blurb from that page to give you some idea of what it's about. Richard Rose advised seekers to become a vector, to marshal the energy and activity of one's life and direct that towards the discovery of an answer. To be sure, in the beginning stages of the spiritual path, the individual may accrue some benefit from the search, finding him or herself riding easier in the saddle. Yet at some point, the seeker may intuit that he or she, the ego, is what's in the way. To seek the truth, capital T truth, as an egoless vector then, would involve the continued application of effort toward making that discovery, without fear of failure or hope of gain, without anything for the separate separate sense of self. Is it even possible for a seeker to expedite this change of being, egolessness? And if so, how? Come explore with others how we might apply or become this advice. Let us open our hearts and minds to find ways forward. This is a virtual gathering where seekers as well as finders may help each other while sharing their stories, successes, and struggles. We aspire to foster an environment where the bonds of true friendship and spiritual community will be formed and renewed. This virtual event is being offered for a minimal fee of $35 for TAT members and $40 for non-members. Go to tatfoundation.org and you'll see a big banner right on the home page for the event. It's worth attending. You know, Normally we have live meetings, uh, but with COVID-19 we've switched to a virtual format. Uh, the April meeting was quite interesting and I think everyone thought that it was worthwhile to attend that one. What's neat about this meeting is that there will be more interaction because we'll actually break out into small groups for some of the sessions. So as much as possible, we're trying to replicate some of that experience of meeting live. So that's enough for the announcements. Now to the show. So Joe Morewood is the spiritual director of the Center for Sacred Sciences in Eugene, Oregon. For over 30 years, he's helped guide seekers on the spiritual path through as many talks, essays, and books, as well as helped fashion a body of teachings that calls upon the great mystical traditions. I had a great time talking with Joel, and I hope you all pick up some of the spirit of our conversation. Enjoy, and I will hope to be hearing and perhaps seeing some of you all soon. Well, again, uh... Just thank you, Joel. It's uh, great to have this opportunity to talk with you, and uh, I'm looking forward to our discussion today. I'm delighted to be here. And uh, I wanted to uh, just start off by uh, saying that I 
I'm sure that some of your background will come up uh, during the talk today, but I will point people towards the interview that you did uh, with the Bat Gap, Buddha at the Gas Pump, uh, which I watched uh, before doing this interview, and you all talked a, quite a bit about your story, and uh, so I don't intend to get into too much of that today. Fine, uh, fine. I do want to give uh, just kind of a, a 30 second overview for folks of my notes about your background, and then you can add anything that you feel like I've missed that's important to that. Uh, Great. And, and again, after listening to that back gap, back gap interview, uh, I noted that you served in Vietnam for a year. I did. Coming back from that, you got into the hippie movement, uh, became a Maoist revolutionary, made radical documentaries. Uh, at some point, you moved to Hollywood and uh, got into the belly of that beast, becoming <laughs> an associate producer, a vice president. You spent about 10 years at that. Uh, eventually, your marriage broke up. You got disillusioned with Hollywood. Uh, you met a woman who was into mysticism, and that's kind of how you got into this, is, is through her interest, uh, but eventually uh, started doing practices on your own and developing your own interest. Uh, you bought a van at some point, traveled around the country to visit various communities, uh, uh, one thing I noted was that in the back of your mind was this thought that, well, if I get enlightened someday, I'll win over this lady that I really like. Uh, I could kind of relate to that sentiment. Uh, but at some point she broke up with you, and that's when your life uh, ground to a halt, and you had an awakening or enlightenment experience. Uh, Sometime not too long after that. Uh, uh, that was actually during the trip. Oh, during the trip. Yeah. And okay. then uh, uh, I, I continued on with the trip, but it was towards the end of what would have been the end of the, Well, about actually more to uh, the middle of the trip. It was in August 13th. So, and I had planned on being, you know, out on this road for uh, another month or two. And that's what ended up being what... It was during the trip. Got it. And uh, I got the impression, uh, I don't think you talked about this much on the other interview, but I got the impression that uh, not too long after your enlightenment experience, uh, you found yourself uh, becoming more involved in the role as a teacher uh, and eventually the Center for <clears throat> Sacred Sciences, I believe it is, was founded and you have been working uh, with that for since uh, 1987, 88, somewhere Eight, in there. 87 was, 87 was the founding of the center, yes. 1987. Great. So for a lot of years, and, uh, and I hope that uh, we, get to, we can talk about that a bit and what some of your learnings have been from the many years that you've been working as a teacher. Great. Uh, I just add to that um, mm -hmm. something that I think is important about my story that actually ties in with uh, what I read about your story. At a certain point, um, after you'd been uh, with Richard Rose for a while, and you actually gave up, you felt you'd failed to attain enlightenment. And uh, so you, you sort of basically said, okay, well, that's over. Uh, now what am I going to do with my life? And is that correct? Oh, I definitely felt like I I wasn't going to be able to do this. Yes. Yes. So when I uh, when I was on the road, I had really gone on the road. Uh, basically, went over Samantha was her name, and uh, and enlightenment. I mean, they were they were in my mind wrapped up together. And uh, when she broke up with me, it was a phone call, and she basically found somebody else. And so I again, like you, I I just felt okay. I failed completely. I mean, I've been an idiot. I, I gave up my life in Hollywood, uh, you know, trying pursuing this woman, and um, there's nothing left here. So I, it really plunged me into this weird state I'd never been in before in my life. I call I call kenosis, which is a Greek word meaning meaning self emptying, uh, but it was um, 
it was like, it's similar to a dark night of the soul. You'll find other descriptions of this in the, in the literature. Uh, but I think this was uh, key because I gave up all effort to become enlightened. I, I gave up all effort to, to find happiness, to do anything. I had no idea what to do. My life was just like on automatic pilot. And so uh, when I did wake up, uh, it was... <laughs> It seemed to me at the time just pure grace. I mean, it seemed to have nothing to do with any of the practices I had done or whatever. Later, I changed my mind about that. But at the time, it was, um, you know, in this in this state of total uh, effortlessness. Effortlessness meaning I just, I, I had no, I couldn't, if I thought about the future, I just, my mind was blank. There was nothing I wanted, nothing I was, you know, uh, striving for anymore. So it was just... Um, so I think that's important from a psycho-spiritual perspective of, for me at least, that's how an awakening happened in that kind of state at that point in my life. And from reading, uh, you know, the stories of other mystics and so forth, I think it's quite common uh, that people go through this <coughs> dark night. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Uh Something that you said, I would like to dive into a little bit. You said that uh, uh, you initially felt that what happened to you had nothing to do with what you'd been doing, the practices that you'd been doing, but later you changed your mind about that. Could you could you expound on that a little more? Yeah. Uh, I had been doing, I had not been a, a, a deeper, a long-term practitioner. I'd been meditating for about a year, uh, pretty regularly and, and, uh, pretty intensely. But, you know, I was no, by no means more than, you know, really a beginner meditator. Uh, I had adopted some precepts, especially for this journey I was on, visiting these spiritual communities. It was kind of like a pilgrimage. And they were, uh, you know, interesting. They, I, one of the precepts was that I knew I was going to be going to a lot of communities with vegetarian food, and I was a meat eater and, you know, wine drinker and all the things that Jesus was. Um, and so, uh, but I took a vow not to judge the food, just eat what's put before you. Uh, so that was very interesting because it brought up a lot of attachments I had about, you know, what was good food and what I liked or didn't like and all that. So I had these these kinds of uh, <coughs> uh, beginning sorts of practices, which I was pretty faithful in trying to follow. And then, of course, inquiry. I did a lot of who am I kind of inquiry. Um, <coughs> excuse me. And and my devotional practice was centered on Samantha. She was the object of unconditional love. I tried to practice unconditional love with as her as the object of that. But these, you know, I said, I was only been doing these for about a year or so. So it wasn't like I was a, a long-term practitioner. Uh, but, uh, it, you know, when I, it was only after I just gave them up, not only gave them up, but gave them up in the, in the sense of, uh, not for something else. I just, uh, they weren't working. They just weren't working, you, you know? And so I, I quit. Now, what I later began to realize, uh, and this is partly from working with Dr. Wolf, which we can get into later, but um, that this is the point of practices. They make you uh, quit. Uh, practices are designed to self-destruct, literally, in both senses of that term, self-destruct. They are designed to, to uh, destroy themselves, but they are also designed to destroy the self that is trying to do the practice. So uh, this is a, an interesting paradox, and it comes up a lot in our modern times where the, this, uh, I wrote an essay, in fact, called To Practice or Not to Practice, uh, which is on our website if anybody wants to find it. And it uh, talks about this issue. There are some teachers who say, don't practice, don't do any practice, don't do any meditation, just realize the truth, you know, just realize and then other teachers, and especially teachers from the more established traditions, the Tibetans, uh, Buddhists, for instance, you know, insist that practice is really necessary and you need to practice and so forth. And then you'll find teachers, uh, the, the, a single teacher will at one time talk about the need for practice and then talk about that practice is worthless. So what's going on here? And I think that this is a question of being stage-specific. 
you're given the practices, uh, whether they tell you or not they're going to work, you, you, of course you believe they're going to work. You believe you're going to get enlightened. That's why you're doing the practice. And you do them and do them and do them until you exhaust all that effort. And if you've put all your energy and your goals in life and everything into this one goal of attaining enlightenment, and, and all your effort to do that fails then you are forced to surrender. It's not like you decide to surrender. It's like you are surrendered. You become surrendered, whether you like it or not. And in that space, that's when, as uh, Dr. Wolf used to say, Yogi, Franklin Merrill Wolf, the, for people who are listening, then the heavens may open up. And that's happened to me, and I think that's uh, very true. So as a paradox in the practice, you... Uh, and this is, oh, by the way, very clear in Zen Cohen practice. You're given an insoluble Cohen. What is the sound of one hand clapping? The mind cannot solve that problem. Now, but it only works if you, if you really, really try to solve it, if you give it all you've got. And then you get to the point where, what's the point? You, you, you know, you, you let it go and you let it go and you get let go of. Anyway, that's why I said I, I changed my mind after a while when I began to realize how these practices actually worked. I had no idea of that when I was doing the practices. I thought, of course, this is going to get me enlightened and then I'll get Samantha. Then everything will be hunky-dory and I'll be happy the rest of my life. And when you... When you became involved in or founded the Center for Sacred Sciences, did you have uh, did you have a teaching worked out? <laughs> Is that uh, were you fumbling around the first few years? Where what what was that like? Well, uh, as I would transition to right, a teacher. Right. Well, you know who Franklin Merrill Wolf is because that was reading his induction essay actually was a, a transcript of a talk uh mm -hmm. is what uh keyed your enlightenment as i gather from your book right mm -hmm. that's correct so, uh, so um <clears throat> now uh when I, on this journey that i was taking in the beginning of the journey before i was awake i had heard about franklin merwolf he was still alive at the time this was 1983 and he was living in uh, lone pine california a little desert town on the mojave desert there the high desert. And um, so I put him on my uh, itinerary and I stopped by, the, we called it the ranch. It really wasn't a ranch. It was a ranch house out in the middle of the desert outside of town, up halfway up the Sierras. Uh, beautiful, beautiful spot, by the way. And um, I spent three or four days there. And he was the first person, first of all, I met that I was really convinced was enlightened. Uh, he was, uh, at that time, he was 96 years old, 95. I'm I think the first time I met him. Anyway, he was, he was in his mid-90s. And uh, so his teaching days were basically over. Uh, he was sort of, you know, retired. But he still, people found him. They came to his door and he had local students who'd come up and he'd hold a meeting every Sunday. And uh, so he was uh, still uh, performing the function of teaching. He'd play those old reel-to-reel -reel tapes of talks he'd given and recorded uh you know, in the years before, because he, he was too old to actually give a, a teaching on a Sunday, but he'd play one of his uh, tapes, and then we'd all sit around and discuss it and so forth. So uh, being in his presence, being with him, uh, I began to, uh, this is the first time I really had an in-flesh teacher, although, oh, this was before I, I uh, woke up, I, I realized, okay, several things. First of all, he was like, uh, he came from California, uh, rural California. He dressed like a Westerner, American Westerner. He wore, you know, uh, uh, three-piece suits and a ca cowboy hat. He, lo he looked like, you might think of, if Doc Holliday had lived to be 95, you know. <laughs> and, well, because he was from that century, you know. He grew up uh, in the, his early childhood. It was in the, ninth, the end of the 19th century. Um so anyway, and and then I was visiting these communities where people were adopting all kinds of uh, Indian customs, Eastern customs, Asian customs, sandals and incense and all that. And uh, 
we called him Dr. Wolf, by the way. He was a doctor of philosophy back in the 19th century. That was, uh, you know, we don't call doctors of philosophy anymore. We call them professors or something. But he, he was a, he had a PhD, a doctorate in philosophy. That's how we called him that. We called him, uh, as affectionately, we called him just Yogi. Uh, but anyway, <clears throat> he didn't have any of that. He was just a, an ordinary Westerner. He ate uh, uh, fried chicken. Uh, he and it, he didn't like he didn't like vegetables much. He had a nurse, a student that took care of him, and she kept trying to feed him salads. And so he'd say, "Do I look like a cow? That's grazing food." <laughs> <coughs> so uh, what I came away with was here was someone, and just being in his presence. I mean, he was like completely transparent. It was like no shadow, no you know, uh, no. He wasn't, no ego. He wasn't after anything. He wasn't even trying to impress anybody. I can tell you stories about him later, but uh, just being with him was, was a, a teaching in itself. Uh, and then I, I went away, uh, left and went on the rest of my journey. Then I woke up and then I'm coming back and I had in the back of my mind or, or I'd had this impulse to, arising to record my story, write a book about it, a spiritual biography and I didn't have any plans of being a teacher or anything like that. It was just, I felt it was, you know, a, a payback that I could uh, pay it forward. I could, if, if I could wake up, anybody can wake up. And I would bear witness to that. And I'd write this book and I'd send it out there. And if people were interested, they'd read it or not. It didn't matter to me. And I, so I was looking for a place to write this book. And I had a little money left over from my Hollywood days, stuff was stuck in the bank. So I, um, uh, was, you know, sort of in the back of my mind looking for wherever I went, was this be a nice place to stop and maybe settle down for a while and write the book? Well, on the, at the end of the trip, on the, just going back to L.A., I was passing by Dr. Wolf's place again. So I drove up and I stopped by and visited for a while. And on his property, uh, there was his ranch house that he and his uh, caretaker lived. And then there were uh, several other houses that, elderly students of his had owned or rented from him and they lived in these places and there was a, a cabin really it's not a house a cabin and it was um uh, owned by a guy named murray one of his students murray and viola his wife and uh they were up there and but they had retired and they were living down in some barstow or someplace down in the, the lower desert and they had this cabin and they were going to be leaving on the next day and I said, well, Murray, what do you, what happens to your cabin when you're, uh, you know, not here? Because he comes like several times a year. And he says, he just sits there. I said, you want to rent your cabin to me? And I, he said, yes. So we made a deal. So I rented his cabin. So I'm living, you know, just down the road from Dr. Wolf. And, uh, and I, I moved in there and I lived there for a year and a half. So I had this wonderful opportunity to be with him and to, um, watch how, uh, he taught not I say not directly anymore but just his presence and also listening to his talks and then he had a wonderful library and I started borrowing his books and I started learning about Buddhism and Sufism and uh, all kinds of uh, traditions that I had only touched the surface of uh, in my own on my own path and then uh, I still had no intention of being a teacher but people started asking me well particularly his caregiver Andrea, her name was, and uh, she starts saying, uh, she'd come down to visit me from, from his house, and she'd say, I can tell you, you, by the way you talk, you know something. So I told her about my awakening, <clears throat> and uh, then she started to ask me questions. And then uh, a um, professor from the, the U of O here, uh, Amit Goswami, and his wife Maggie came down to see Dr. Wolf, not me, but we got to talking, and... Um, he started saying, uh, well, asking me about my path and all that. And he and Maggie then wanted to be my formal uh, students, uh, disciples like in India, you know, uh, treated me like a guru. Well, this is, you know, but I, I had no reason to say no, you know. And finally they asked me, I went back and I spent a year or so in, in L.A. And they finally came and said, look, we have to come down from uh, Oregon uh, down here, all the way down here to LA to visit you. To, you know, why don't why don't you come up and stay with us in uh, Eugene, Oregon? Uh, their their kids had all moved out of the house, and we could start a center. So that's how I ended up being there. So, but 
the, the point I'm trying to make here is that people started asking me to teach. I, I had, you know, <clears throat> wasn't my intention or plan at all. And yes, you're right. I was fumbling around. I didn't know what to do. When I was, went back to LA for this year, I started taking meditation uh, classes from a Tibetan Buddhist and uh, going around visiting various, mostly Tibetan centers, but also Sufi centers and went to see Krishna Murti and uh, trying to learn how to teach. And I've spent, uh, that's been the rest of my life, learning how to teach so I could teach. And that's what I've been doing for the last you know, 40 years or so. I don't know if that answers your question. I didn't mean to go on and on like that. But. Oh, it does. I, I definitely appreciate it. The uh, I've noticed uh, in your talks and in the uh, materials that are available on the website that you do, you reference a lot of other traditions. And I get the impression, and uh, and perhaps you can say more about it, but I get the impression that you've tried to pull from what you have a feeling are the, the best practices and assemble them into something of a unique system. Uh, yes, uh, I, but um, not a, a really a unique system. I'm trying to uh, cull the, uh, the most uh, the common principles from all these traditions, universal principles, the uh, the core teachings of the mystics of these traditions, and show how they are basically all uh, just different versions of the same teaching. Uh, and I, well, if, again, if you want to get the background of this, when I during this period after I had been with Doctor Wolf and after people had asked me to teach, and after I was back in Hollywood or in the L.A. area, um, and I was visiting these various. Uh, spiritual teachers from different traditions, but primarily Buddhist. And I would think, wow, these are great teachings. I just should become a Buddhist. <clears throat> or then I'd go to a, a visit a, a Sufi camp. I said, these are fantastic teachings. I just become a Sufi because the teachings are already available. You know, I mean, there's a whole history of teachings. I don't have to invent anything. Um, but always something in the back of my mind would say, no, no, that's not. That's not for you. That's not the way you can go. And one of the things is, uh, when I was a kid, my parents weren't particularly religious, but they, at that time, uh, this was in the 1940s, to have a baptismal certificate was actually important. Uh, it was almost like a, a birth certificate. It was a part of your identity. It had legal ramifications. I don't know what it was, but my parents did want to get me baptized but they decided to wait until I was of age where I could, you know, participate. So <clears throat> uh, they didn't baptize me as a baby. Well, by the time I got to be 13 or 14 or whatever, I had lost all faith in... Uh, oh, I, they had sent me to an Episcopal church school, so I did have an exposure to Christianity, which was very interesting. But I uh, lost all faith in Christianity by the time I reached the age to be baptized, so I didn't want to be baptized. So I was never baptized. So I am not part of any tradition, uh, even by by birth and, and uh, you know, upbringing. Uh, and there was something about that that kept me from joining any of these traditions uh, that made me feel, well, there was a reason then that this didn't happen. You know, looking back from awakening, uh, I found it's not that you, like, know the reason for everything that happened to you, but everything happened to you beforehand turns out to be useful in some way it comes back to you in, in a new form you know and say oh wow and uh you can use it so so this kept me from actually you know taking what to me looked like the easy route with just you know become a buddhist and there you got it all laid out for you so i started then examining these various traditions which all i love them i mean you know i just uh i read Ibn Arabi, a great uh, uh, Sufi, and uh, it's just I, I become a Sufi for the time I'm reading him, or, or Rumi, of course, or um, you know Ramana Maharshi. I mean, uh, you know, there's pure teachings like that. <clears throat> but anyway, I uh, and then I see uh, 
uh, oh, oh, this this person is saying exactly what this person is saying. Oh, they're they're from different traditions, different times, different places, uh, and so you begin to uh, get a picture of the, the how these teachings work. What are the core principles? And that's my life's work has been trying to ferret that out. There's nothing new or original. It's just trying to ferret that out and maybe give it a modern form, something that's, um, you know, more accessible to a, a, a people in a scientific age. Um, so that's really been what my work's about, and that's how it kind of came about. But by the way, let me put in a plug right here for people who are interested. My, uh, aside from my uh, spiritual autobiography, I wrote a book called The Way of Selflessness that gives my... Uh, interpretation of how all these core teachings of these mystics uh, come together and make a complete uh, path to awakening. So it's a practical, uh, it's a manual for awakening, really, but it's drawing on all these teachings. It's not just a Buddhist manual or a Sufi manual or Christian or something like that. And is that a fairly recent book? Uh, let's see. Uh, Tom? When did the uh, Way of Selflessness get published? Do you remember? I don't know the date off the top of my head, but um, you could actually. Do you mind maybe, taking a peek and see? Anyways, it's, it's at least ten years old, maybe even a little bit older. Tom's going to look it up now. Okay, yeah. I was I was just curious because uh, uh, I yeah I originally contacted Tom back in. 2017 and he said yeah. uh oh joel's working on a book and he's not going to be available for uh, another year that's another book <laughs> okay. 2000 by the way 2009 was a uh, way of selflessness okay yeah and, you know actually tom and i are both working on a book which we've been working on for the last 20 years uh, which is a book about uh science and mysticism but um we're not finished with that yet actually <laughs> we still got a ways to go but it's been a, a very rich and rewarding uh, journey. Mm -hmm. Hopefully, we'll, hopefully we'll eventually get it finished. But the way of selfness is the one that is a uh, directed towards anybody who's interested in a mystical spiritual path, uh, and and the traditional um, called classical teachings from all these traditions, and how you can implement them in your life. Uh, another question and. Uh... And I feel like this line of questions is sort of, uh, all right, I'll give Joel my impressions of what I see, and then he can correct my impressions if they're Fine. off. Uh, it looked to me that, uh, and you definitely have several students or members of the Center for Sacred Sciences that have themselves become teachers. They've had right. enlightenment experiences and have right. become teachers. Right. Uh, I listened to or read a couple of their transcripts of their talks and i got the impression that they they're wide ranging in terms of they worked with other teachers and other systems and it wasn't i didn't get the impression that it was you know i'm a devotee of joel and joel took me <clears throat> to enlightenment uh <laughs> yes and i i encourage that i encourage people to uh you know go to other teachers and um uh, learn from other teachers, and I don't, uh, I don't, and in, in fact, it, um, I, I wouldn't say I discourage people from that kind of guru worship uh, that is common in places like India. Uh, I, I think it's partly a cultural thing. I think it works great in India, probably, but it's, it doesn't translate over here sometimes very well. And um, so, you know, if people want to think of me as their guru in their heart and all that, I mean, if they're fine but I, there's no displays of uh you know guru worship at the center <laughs> in fact people are sometimes shocked at how how uh what rudely my students treat me uh but uh it's it's perfectly fine with me that's exactly the way i'd want it what is uh can you give me a sense of uh I mean, I can see all the work that you have done and are doing to try to find these commonalities and distill them into a form that is the most effective or powerful, however you want to phrase that. Uh, do you, 
as a teacher, do you do you work closely with students? Do you advise students? Do you uh, what what is that like? Or is your role more uh, a step back and uh, kind of overseeing what's going on at the center? It's become more the latter. Uh, it started out, um, you know, we started out uh, with literally six people in a living room. So, uh, and for several years, the center was very small. Uh, uh, you know, the, we could, how many people we could pack into our living room? Twelve people got to be 14 people. Finally, we had to move. Uh, my wife, Jennifer, and I bought a house uh, with a with a special room that we could accommodate a larger groups and so forth. So over the years, it's grown. In the beginning, I was the only teacher. And yes, I would uh, give uh, talks on Sundays. And then we had a practitioner group that met on during the week. And then I would do individual consultations with students. And um, so... Uh, so that, that that was 15 years, 10, 15 years. But as other of uh, my students woke up and became teachers, and as after I finished that book, Way of Selflessness, and wanted to concentrate more on this other book that I just told you Tom and I are working on about science and mysticism, I more and more uh, sort of turned over the teaching, the day-to-day -day teaching to our other center teachers. So they hold practitioners groups where people come once a week and then they have their, their students. I mean, their students, you know, one year you could take a, a practitioner's group from, uh, uh, Hiromi, uh, the next year you could take it from Todd and it doesn't, you're not, you don't have to choose a teacher, but some students are attracted more to one teacher or another and they call on them for consultations and so forth. So the same style has continued, but I've taken more of a backseat uh, role here. And I uh, assume, uh, since you're doing that, that you feel uh, pretty good about the direction that the that the center is headed in. And and uh, well, uh, you know, again, I uh, see. Ever since my awakening, I I don't choose anything. I really, I mean, I, in a relative mundane sense, of course, you know, you, you go to a restaurant, and I'll choose, uh, you know, the lamb curry over the. Uh, Brussels sprouts or something, but in terms of the direction of my life, the center and all that, it just, it all seems to unfold. In fact, you have a, a wonderful line in your book that I, I, I'm going to, I'm going to borrow and use in my teachings. Uh, you say, I don't know if you got it exactly right, but after your awakening, you said, I'm no longer feel I'm being driven. I feel like I'm being discovered. Mm -hmm. And that's my life. Every day it's a, a discovery. And so the center itself has been a discovery. I didn't set out to create a center. And sometimes people ask, like, what's the long-range vision for the center? And, you know, I really, there isn't a long-range vision. It'll grow organically if it's useful to people. And it'll <laughs> wither and die when it's not. And uh, it, all that's, none of that's up to me. Uh, you know, that's, um, I just do what I do. And uh, if people, if they find it useful, they, they're welcome to use it. And, uh, and uh, it's and reciprocal, by the way, because all these, the teaching uh, with my students is itself enriches the general teaching. You know, oh, well, that's how I find out what things work. Oh, oh, this person comes to me, they tried this practice, they give me the feedback. I, oh, yeah, okay. So uh, it, it's all... Uh, you know, it's all food going into the same pot. And uh, like one of the other ones, that this French have some stew that they're famous for, food is something. You're, anybody who's a Francophile in your uh, audience will know what I'm talking about. The, the old people cook it over a, a fireplace. And you never, the stew never gets, um, uh, you never stop and, and, and dish it all out and wash out the pot. You just keep adding things into it. And so it gets richer and richer and richer. So, actually, I feel that the um, the whole mystical, uh, the great tradition of mystical teachings itself is like that, and certainly the the uh, center uh, certainly is, is like that. It is. Uh, it's relatively 
Well, at least in some, from some perspectives, it's relatively unusual to come across uh, schools where there are students who are having enlightenment experiences and becoming teachers. There's a lot of there's a lot of groups where there's one teacher and the students are perpetually students, and <laughs> then eventually the maybe they should go to another group. <laughs> You know, eventually the teacher passes away and leaves the students fighting amongst themselves as to who will try to carry on. Do you feel, uh, this is probably a tough question or impossible question, do you feel like there's, like you've, like you've found some potent mix that is working? Uh, I don't feel I've found uh, anything that's working. I feel like there is a potent mix here. Uh, that is working. Uh, and, but I, I, I say, I, it's not something I, I kind of planned. You know, one of your principles is honesty. One of the most important things for a teacher is honesty. Honesty in the sense that as in, in a, a, you know, in a relative limited sense, uh, there, your teaching is, uh, there's only so much you can do. You know, mm-hmm. most, it, it's up to the students, really. And, um, and there's, and there's almost, uh, only so much you can know. And so, uh, if you are aware and complete transparent and open about your own limitations, it, it uh, brings out, uh, uh, potentials in people that maybe, uh, they don't dare bring out in the presence of somebody that seems overwhelmingly superior, wiser, you know, something like that. So maybe I'm just, I'm just now reflecting on it, talking to you. Maybe that's part of the, the uh, what's going on here. Uh, but by the way, not everybody wakes up uh, yeah, as one of my students necessarily ends up being a teacher at the center. There's a guy named Tom Kurtzka who uh, you could find. Uh, he lives in Eugene and he's got a website and stuff and he does teachings. And a lot of uh, my students or students at the center uh, actually go over and, and uh, he does a more of a satsang kind of uh, teaching format. <clears throat> and um, they get an awful lot from him. And he tried for after about a year after his awakening, he tried to sort of follow the center format of uh, leading retreats uh, and de- doing these weekly practitioners groups and so forth. And it just, it wasn't for him. So he found his own style of teaching and he teaches. And as I say, uh, a lot of uh, students go back and forth between us, which is perfectly fine with me. Uh, <clears throat> I, you know, I, I say sometimes, partly jokingly, but partly not, my job is to put myself out of business, see? So, you know, if I if I could go uh, next Sunday where all my students are together, well, we're not doing it now because of the COVID-19 um lockdown but we're, we're doing zoom meetings now by the way but um if i could do that or even on zoom and say okay here's the secret listen carefully this is the great teaching blah 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 blah, blah. They all wake up and they all woke up i would be so delighted i could retire i wouldn't have anything more to do no more talks to prepare <clears throat> no more practices to do. you know i used to do practices i just still do sometimes uh, just to, to see what effect they had. I, I never tried, I never want to teach a practice that I haven't tried myself, you know. Um, but, um, you know, it's work. Mm-hmm. And along that line, you you mentioned the idea that this work, the practices, are ultimately designed to uh, I forget what you said, the phrase you used, but something like uh, burn themselves up or... That's good. Just, self-destruct. Self-destruct, right. To self-destruct. Uh, knowing how complex the mind is and how it can turn itself in circles, have you? Uh, do you run across people who find themselves saying, well, the only reason I'm doing all these practices is because, I, you know, this idea that if I do them hard enough, eventually I'll burn out and then I'll get enlightened. Yes, right. <laughs> well, that's what keeps them going. I hope they, I hope they do have that idea. <laughs> because, look, this is the point. You can't, 
it's not about, it's like, okay, let's try the spiritual path. That didn't work out. So what do I do with my life? Well, maybe I should go back to law school and get my degree. That ha- that has not exhausted that fundamental drive for happiness. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So you know, for the spiritual path to work, you really have to put all your eggs in one basket. You really have to have that energy, that enthusiasm, that passion for the truth. Uh, so if it's a, if it's a hobby on the side, okay, so you didn't get enlightened. So, uh, you know, it was kind of fun. And by the way, some people in this, uh, this life, that's, that's their attitude and it's fine. You can get a lot of enrichment from walking a spiritual path short of full blown enlightenment. You know, it, it really opens you up to love and compassion. Uh, it, it, um, a lot of the practices are about taking the attention off I, me, and mine. And, and giving it to other people. And through that process, you learn that, that, you know, really happiness lies in the direction of selflessness, not in the direction of self, uh, uh, moreness, uh, you know, and we're trained, conditioned and so forth to look at life and say, well, you know, how can I get more and more and more? How can I enhance and defend this self? And it just, uh, it leads us into greater and greater unhappiness. If it would work, it would be great. I, I'd recommend it. <laughs> Go be happy that way, but it doesn't work. And so it's very hard for us to learn, and we do that through practice, through our own experience, that no, if you stop trying to get more and more for yourself, if you start living a life more based on love love and compassion, uh, and you start to open up to that, and, and then if you do uh, meditation practices and inquiry practices, you see how your own conditioning works. You see how your own attachments cause suffering. And when you can actually see that, then you can let them go. And uh, and they become weaker and weaker and more and more spaciousness opens up, uh, more and more warmth. And, uh, and you see, oh, I'm happier. And so it doesn't have to be all or nothing from my point of view. But if you if you do want enlightenment, if that really is, if you want to know who you are and what this is all about, Alfie, uh, then you really have to make a commitment. Uh, except there's always some exceptions. You know, every once in a while you read about somebody like uh, Wei Ning. He was a Zen master, a great patriarch. And as the story goes, uh, he was an illiterate uh, woodcutter. And he was uh, had a bundle of wood he was selling in a courtyard at some place. And he heard a monk from a local monastery chanting, I think it was the Diamond Sutra, one of the great sutras. And he heard the line, uh, emptiness is form, form is emptiness, form is not, emptiness is not other than form, form is not other than emptiness. And boom, his mind opened up. And right there on the spot. And then he went to the monastery and he had an interview with the Zen master and, um, uh, anyway, he became, ultimately, later he became a great uh, a patriarch, Zen patriarch in his own right. Now, interesting though, he, in his writings, uh, attributes that awakening to a lot of spiritual practice he did in a former lifetime. So even he didn't think it was all that spontaneous. But uh, in any case, it uh, it is true. Ramana Maharshi had very little formal, any kind of formal spiritual practice and so forth. And look what happened to him. But again, in his case, uh, I assume most of your listeners know his story, but just very briefly, he was a teenager. Uh, he had uh, come home from school, he put his books down or whatever, and he suddenly got this overwhelming idea that he was going to die. And I'm not even clear whether he thought he was going to die immediately or he just had that realization I had when I was a teenager. Oh my gosh, someday I'm going to die. And it just shocked him. And he, uh, and but then this is what he did. Most of us would uh, try to distract ourselves. We turn on the TV. We'd go for a walk. We'd call a friend, play some music, anything. But he went into the experience of death, and he lay down on the floor, and he made his body stiff as though he's having rigor mortis. And in his mind's eye, he traveled into death. He saw that he was dead. Uh, they came, they took his corpse to the funeral grounds where they burn up, you know, the funeral pyre. They burned it up and there was nothing left except pure consciousness. So 
he, this was his whole spiritual path. His whole spiritual path. Now, look at the passion, the concentration. And he himself said, the shock of the fear of death drove my mind inward, single-pointedly. So you have to be ready uh, for that to happen, even if it's a very short period of time. Death was his teacher. He had, I don't know, lasted, what, 15 minutes, half an hour? I don't know how long this whole thing went. Uh, Anyway, uh, so this is what I'm talking about, these principles that come up again and again. Uh, Mm -hmm. And... um, you know, so advice to someone is, okay, if you don't have that passion, fine, maybe you just sent you in a spiritual path. That's great. Keep at it. You might, you might get the, you know, uh, you might get infected by the passion and then you're lost. You know, once you, once it's got you, uh, once you're in the grip of the, the quest for enlightenment, it won't let you go. So, uh, I think a lot of people, it happened to me anyway, you get to the point where you, you try to, uh, let go. You try to give up the path. You realize that you're going to change your whole life around. Maybe you don't want that. And uh, in fact, I'll tell you a little story. When I was on my path, I was living in LA. I was still working in Hollywood. And I was uh, living in a little, uh, I split up with my wife and I had a little place up in Topanga Canyon. Maybe some of you uh, listeners will know about that. But in any case, uh, I, and I was spending a lot of time alone there meditating reading Ramana, uh, not Ramana, but um, uh, the Bhagavad Gita and Meister Eckhart and Lakamatara Sutra and these books. And uh, and I was really starting to withdraw from that Hollywood glamorous life. And I, it's kind of scared me a little bit. I mean, you know, where, where, where's this all going to take me? And so one evening I, I decided, okay, that's it. I'm, I'm getting off this path. I'm going to go down. There was a, a kind of a, a bar kind of place, uh, at the bottom of the road, that, uh, the hill I lived on. I drove down there. I went in. And there was live music. <clears throat> I started flirting with some of the girls at the bar. And other, but you know what? It, w- it didn't do it for me anymore. The, all the juice and the joy had gone out of it. So I, I had a few drinks. I got back in my car. I got back up in the, to my place in the hills. I opened the door. I said, okay, here I am, back on the path. I couldn't get off it even. I wanted to. <laughs> it wouldn't let me go. So, uh, you know, this is the paradox of, of, of effort and grace and, and will. And at every step of the way you go, you, you know, you, we go, we go, we, we think we're in charge and then something happens and we, we let go a little bit and, oh, something else takes over. So, uh, I think it's a, a rhythm. I think it's just the way actually life works because actually our thinking we're doing anything you know, from the ultimate point of view, is is ridiculous. There's only there's only one uh, one will in the universe, one will in the cosmos. Uh, and consciousness itself is doing it all. So, uh, yeah, this question of uh, this question of effort it keeps coming up again and again and again right. in the circles that that I'm in, and I think a lot of it has to do with with uh, those teachings and teachers who really emphasize that there's no one here who's doing anything. You, you're already awakened. If, you know, you, you, it's right in front of your eyes. Uh, you have, a, to me, it's almost like a, a camp of teachers who are in that group. And then you have a camp that's in this group of you know, this takes commitment, this takes effort, you have to work. Um, and so I, I find people, uh, there's a question that was posed to me a few weeks ago. Someone said, uh, is all of this effort that of a big ego searching for truth? When we come to the conclusion that effort is fruitless or even worse, building up a spiritual ego... Uh, is this just a false passivity of that same spiritual ego? <laughs> and how do we know the difference between that <laughs> and true detachment? Great. So you can see this person's really got themselves wrapped in a knot. Uh, what what are you, what would be your reaction to that? Yeah. Keep going. Keep going. 
That's me. Keep them, don't stop. Wrap yourself more and more into a knot because here, I, I'll point something out to that. Uh, there was something he said about do you cut, when you come to the conclusion that mm-hmm. effort is fruitless. Can, mm-hmm. can you read that little part again? Yeah, when we come to the conclusion that the effort is fruitless or even worse, okay. building who, up who, Okay, stop effort. right there. Stop. Who's coming to the conclusion? It was coming to the conclusion. That's that's what you want to look at. This isn't about coming to any conclusions. This is about this is about uh, doing the effort. And oh, uh, Ramana Maharshi has it beautifully put. Let's see if I can remember this. Uh, paraphrase it anyway off the top of my head. He was asked about sadness practices, and he says sadness are necessary for removing obstacles. But then there comes a time when the much cherished sadhana. Uh, when the uh, disciple can no longer do the much cherished sadhana, it, and then something like at that moment, the self reveals itself, uh, the heavens open up basically. Now the key line is that it comes, it, it comes to a point where the the uh, the disciple can no longer do this, the much cherished sadhana. It's not that you give up the practice; you can't do it anymore. You can't do it. You, you know, you, you get to the point where you sit down to meditate and you just can't do it. It won't happen. It won't work. You're going to worship God. You're going to surrender yourself to God. Okay, here I am, God. And, and you have to, you know, you have to surrender everything, all your will, every little ounce of your will. So here I am, God. I am going to decide to surrender. Well, who's, who's the one who's deciding to surrender? Whose will is that? That's the moment you make the inquiry. Right there. So, you know, yes, you're, you're right, uh, uh, Sean. As long as whoever it is keeps going around in circles, uh, concluding things or trying to come to the right conclusion, there is no right conclusion. The, the conclusion, conclusions are, you know, they're good for about 10 seconds. And then the mind goes chaka, 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 chaka. <laughs> Right, but you, you know, you you did this. I read that uh, that uh, part where you got to in uh, Merrill Wolf's induction uh, essay, uh, where he says, um, uh, "Now you 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 say, okay, I'm not my body, I'm not my thoughts, and uh, and then I I get to this, but I'm still have this sense of of being, uh, of I am, right." Now, what is that? And then I've forgotten exactly how it goes, but he, he says that's the point where the ego starts going round and round and round and round. Remember that? Oh, yeah. Okay, so that's, that's where you're... Where'd you read this from, a blog or something that you just read me? Oh, it was actually a question that was posed. Oh, question, and, okay. Yeah. Mm-hmm. For us? Curious. Uh, are are we was, taking live was, questions? No, it was no. posed to, uh, although that would be kind of a neat idea to take live questions. Oh, we questions. can't take live questions. We're recording it. I forgot. <laughs> okay. All right. See, I, I'm, uh, I'm lost there. Anyway. Um, but it, it was a question which was posed to me a couple of weeks ago uh, for just for comment. You right. Know, what, 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 did I, what would I say to that person? And I was just. You know, it was on topic. I was curious what right. what your response. So, would be. so you tell me when when you got to that point where Doctor Wolf was saying, "Okay, so now we're here. We're at the point where the ego's chasing itself round and round. You know, you're not all these other things. It's trying to figure out what it is. What happened to you? How'd you how'd you uh, get enlightened? Yeah, well, you know, that's not. I think as you're pointing out, that wasn't a conclusion that I came to yes so what did happen you know i had been i had been to that spot before of of the the ego seeing itself in a kind of a circular spin and for uh, a reason that i have no explanation for uh, in that moment i saw that that spin was it it was nothing it was hollow i guess you would say at its core how did you see that hmm. that was um 
it was uh, it was a feeling as much of as anything else of that. Uh, this is there's a truth being presented here, the yeah. the hollowness of that self, and I, so, yeah, it's just yeah. an overwhelming. That's right, like a sword cutting through, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay, so it's not a conclusion. It's not, and so you don't, and it's you know it's good to keep thinking as long as you get to the point where you get to, you exhaust the thought. Keep going. If, if someone's caught in that, in that, um, you know, whirlpool of thought around the ego and what, you know, and all these subtle things, my advice is to keep, not only keep going, do it more, harder, invest everything you have in that. Just like you would a Zen koan, if you were given a Zen koan. Just imagine there's your master standing there with a big stick and he's waiting just to whack you into, if you don't solve that koan. Uh, that's a very good point because uh, there is there's clearly a lot of energy there for this person and a lot of desire to you know right and what, that's all what's the truth of this. Right. So uh, you see, to me, look, these teachers, like you say, the camp of teachers who say, oh, "Don't practice," you know, just realize that all, all practice is an obstacle. Well, in a certain sense, that's true. From an older point of view, all practice is all doing is an obstacle because. Doing that's coming from self, all self-doing, is an obstacle. As long as you're doing, there's a self there. As long as you are doing. That, that doing happens, can happen without a self. But as long as you are trying to do it, there's a you. So, if you are trying to, uh, you know, uh, uh, arrive at the truth, well, you're the, op- the one who's trying to arrive at the truth is the obstacle. If you're trying to surrender to the divine, the one who's trying to surrender is the obstacle. But the thing is, the, the instruction, uh, stop doing it, is, uh, you can't follow that instruction. If, if you can follow that instruction, you're still there doing it. Okay, I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to stop. I'm going to stop doing this. I'm going to stop seeking. I'm going to stop looking for enlightenment. I'm going to stop. Uh, you know, okay, I'm sitting here. No, no, okay, what's going to happen next? So... Uh, it's it's a, it's that's a paradox. It's a correct teaching. In fact, you could say it's the highest teaching. But it, you can't follow that teaching. All teachings are, that are worth anything are instructions. You can't follow that instruction. You can't follow that instruction. Now you might make a koan out of that instruction. You might try to give up the search. Don't don't, don't go back to law school. Don't do something instead. That that will not work. Don't do anything. Stop seeking and don't do anything else. In fact, I sometimes uh, recommend to my students, if you have a day uh, where you can just stay at home, oh, it was perfect this time of the uh, lockdown, the uh, shut-in from the virus, you have a day where you have nothing to do, basically, good. Um, get up in the morning, uh, I don't know, do your, your immediate business, brush your teeth or whatever, and then sit down and don't do anything. Don't you do anything and see what happens. Like the Buddha under the Bodhi tree, you know, he sat down and he swore he would not leave the spot until he got enlightened. But he had been doing six years of intense, hard, ascetic practices. So when he got to that place, he... he, he had given up all the other practices. He'd given up all this effort and trying. He just said, okay, that's it. I'm, this is my spot. I'm sitting here. Let's see what happens. I like that one. Thanks for that. Now, now see, this, what sparked this? That, uh, person who, uh, uh, was asked you that question, right? Mm-hmm. Okay, so this never would have happened without that person. This conversation we just had. Mm-hmm. So it, that it, it all goes back to that person's question. That's what that's what sparked this conversation. That's what sparked this teaching. I mean, if it's worth, I don't know if it's worth anything to anybody, but but it wasn't me, and it wasn't even you. Right. 
And guess what? It wasn't even, is it, can you tell me it's a he or she? It doesn't really matter, but it's one. <laughs> I think it is a woman. Okay. Anyway, I just wanted to, you know, not stumble over the pronouns. Uh, anyway, and, and guess what? From the great scheme of things, she didn't do it either. Consciousness did it. So we're back in that loop, aren't we? <laughs> you see, we're back to the ultimate teaching. But but the ultimate teaching doesn't do you any good until you're awake. And then you don't need it. Oh, the spiritual path is delightful. Right. Isn't it? It's really right. paradoxical. It goes... <laughs> And it drives mm-hmm. people crazy. Well, this is why it's called mysticism. You know, mysticism is a mystery. So uh, it's not a mystery in the sense that, oh, uh, it's it's too um, subtle or refined or arcane that people can't get it. It's it's a mystery because it's so obvious. It's, it's you know, it's a, uh, you can't point to it because pointing is re- uh, totally redundant. Oh, I think Rumi has a wonderful line about uh, uh, complaining about teachers who are go on and on and something like, um, uh, uh, enough, I, I just lost it. What's the point of all that shouting when even a whisper is too much? I don't know. I've forgotten mm-hmm. the line. You can, you can snip that one or you can leave it in. It's, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Well, there I I definitely appreciate your thoughts on that because I think that the whole effort versus non-effort is really something that is on a lot of people's minds, and they spend a lot of time twisting themselves in knots right. about. So I appreciate your thoughts on that. Well, um, I, I, let me just re- reiterate because mm-hmm. if you if anybody out there wants a concise uh, my concise uh, you know last word on that. It is a, a short little article to be, to, I'm sorry, to practice or not to practice. If you, if you Google that, you'll, you'll take you to it. Uh, at least last time I, I, uh, somebody told me they did it. So, uh, if, if anybody wants to pursue what I think about it, that's a good way to go. Good. I will, and if I will look for that myself and link to it, uh, on the show notes for this episode. So great. People will be able to find it easily. Great. Uh, a couple of other questions I, I had. I know we're we're just over an hour now. I don't want to keep you too long. Um, I had come across your book, which is available as a PDF on the website through Death's Gate, yes. the Guide to Selfless Dying. And um, uh, <laughs> for better or for worse, I, I actually just had a friend who I found out committed suicide mm. uh, just the other night and I I had just happened to be reading parts of your book and was reading at the very end there's a, a writing to to read for those who have just passed away mm-hmm. um, and I was curious what in, what inspired you if there was something in particular that inspired you to write that book yes um, uh, in the beginning I have a dedication Bonnie uh, one of my uh, uh, early students and very dedicated student uh, died. Uh, gee, when this was in the nineties, uh, a fairly young age of uh, uh, cancer, and she uh, uh, she was herself was a nurse. She was going out with uh, Todd, who's one of our teachers now, who was a, has been professionally a nurse and stuff. So uh, they they knew what was going on early, and. Uh, she told everybody in our group, and now at that time, you know, we were like 25, 30 people or something, a very small group. And she, so we all went through the dying process with her, so to speak. Um, I'd go over and, and counsel her, and then, uh, you know, everybody, we all knew each other, uh, you know, pretty intimately in the group and stuff. So she uh, she showed us how to die in a, in a certain sense. And at the time, I didn't know anything about, you know, what the great tradition said about death and dying. So I started scrambling around to get her material and uh, whatnot. And then after she did die, uh, I thought, well, I've got all this material assembled and I've got all these experiences here. Let's let's do a book, you know, while, while it's still warm. 
And um, so that's how that, that book came about, that little pamphlet. But it was, again, it was entirely uh, to her, and uh, she's the one who sparked my investigations, and uh, that's how it happened. Hmm. Yeah, well, I, yeah, I appreciate the work that you put into that. That, for me, uh, yeah, came well, at a good was, time. She was a, uh, she was a real inspiration to us, so. Mm-hmm. Money, it's for you. <laughs> uh, a, another comment that, uh, you made, uh, let's see, we... We are not on a spiritual path to develop into more mature human beings. We are on a spiritual path in order to see the nature of reality. Uh, I, I wanted to ask you just a little bit about that because, again, there's, at least from my perspective, there is uh, there's yet another camp of spiritual practitioners who are are really hitting the idea of uh, so much of spiritual practice is actually spiritual bypass. People are hiding from their problems by claiming they're on a quest for enlightenment. They're not, they're not dealing with their personality issues. Uh, there are enlightened people who, are, uh, who have lousy personalities and are going around harming people and so forth and so on. And they're kind of arguing, at least for, I think they're arguing that, look, you, you do have to uh, develop the human being in addition to, uh, or that is a fundamental part perhaps, of the spiritual path is the development of the ordinary world human being. Well, um, again, I think part of it is semantics. Um, I think uh, developing an ordinary uh, world human being is an important uh, thing in any culture, whether you're on a spiritual path or not. So I don't, I don't say that uh, you can bypass that with spiritual practices or something, um, so if somebody is not interested in spiritual, uh, a spiritual life or spiritual practices or anything spiritual, uh, let's say I had a kid who wasn't interested in any of this. It doesn't mean that I wouldn't want to talk to them about becoming a, you know, a better human being, you know, and uh, just in a, in a general social, uh, moral sense. Uh, I don't, I don't think that they, um, you know, that they are exclude each other. Now, if somebody, uh, if a spiritual teacher uh, says um, or thinks that um, you know that developing uh, good you know mor morality is is uh, not necessary uh, and actually kind of discourages it or something, then I, I would I'm wondering why why this is what would interfere with their spiritual practice why they would do that. Uh, so uh, I I do think that personally I've seen that if you take on spiritual practice, particularly practices of, of uh, uh, keeping precepts, morality, ethics, and also cultivating selfless love and compassion, that that uh, almost uh, automatically uh, leads to being a, a, quote, you know, better human being in, in, a, in a cultural and social sense. Uh, you become more open to other people. You become more considerate of other people. Uh, and all that stuff, it kind of flows. I mean, you almost can't do practices of uh, precepts and cultivating love and compassion without that being a result. Now, that's not, again, it's kind of paradoxical. We're not doing it for that result, to make a better society. That's not, from my point of view, the perspective of a spiritual path. That would be gravy. That would be great. And I would, uh, you know, I wouldn't encourage, I would say, yes, uh, it, let's get on a spiritual path, and it and it should have this result. But even if you are, lived on a desert island, and and the 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 virus had wiped everybody else off the planet, there was no hope uh, of of uh, anything for any human beings, any human society. You were the last of the Mohicans there on this island, and you'd still want to practice selfless love and compassion. To the, to the beings around you, you know, the, the centipedes and the snakes and the fish in the, in the sea and stuff. Uh, you still want to practice morality. You still want to practice uh, precepts like not to lie, 
not to deceive myself and others or others by word or deed. Because because you're practicing in order to uh, reveal to yourself your own attachments uh, and uh, your own conditioning, and you can't you cannot let go of conditioning and attachments and so forth unless you are aware of them. So you still want to practice meditation so you can become aware of them. So uh, all these practices, uh, they are making you aware of all the things in you that are causing you suffering. And as you become aware of them, you can drop them. Now that in itself doesn't get you enlightened, but it does clear away the space, more and more space in which that lightning can strike. And it does something else which is very important. If you have a, uh, a realization, awakening, uh, what I would call a Gnostic flash, that is a, a really powerful, complete uh, glimpse of the truth. If that conditioning is still there, chances are it'll come back and it'll sneak up on you and it'll swallow you up again and it'll swallow, swallow you up again. I, I gotta be more careful with my language here. It will it will swallow up that realization and it will uh, create a new ego, sometimes a worse ego, because now it's an ego that's, that's realized, or that thinks it's realized. So, uh, uh, <clears throat> you know, dealing with conditioning is, is uh, really important, but it's not, the ultimate goal is not to uh, just become a better person or a uh, more loving person even, or anything like that. It's... Uh, the truth of a mystical path, other paths, other things, you know, therapies, uh, uh, psychotherapies, and, uh, you know, they're, they're geared to make you a better person in a relative sense. To, so you're ha- relatively happier living in the society with other people, with your uh, family, your colleagues, and all that kind of stuff. All very valuable stuff. I've, I've sent people to therapists that I thought had really serious kinds of conditioning that I wasn't capable of working with because I don't have any background, uh, you know, that kind of background. So I, I think it's, uh, I, I just don't see any contradiction. Let me put it that way. Yeah. Thanks for that. Um, a question that's uh, just for me, really, because, uh, because you were with Merrill Wolf for a period of time. And obviously he has a special place in my heart. Mm, yes. Um, uh, I'm, I'm curious because I have never heard about any of Merrill Wolf's students who were enlightened, and I'm curious if if you knew of any. Uh, that's a good question, and uh, uh, I don't, I don't know of any, and I don't think he knew of any. Yeah, uh, I I was wondering about that because I uh, he in fact yeah, go ahead sorry oh I was just gonna say he uh, his teachings are well I get you know in a sense it was him his being I think that was transmitted in some way through his writing to me some living quality of of that talk that he gave. And I got the impression that his talks, or as you mentioned, being around him, you felt like he was the first person that you'd come across who really had something. And, uh, yeah, I just always wondered. He spent so many years and did so much work that uh, did did any, you know, did did any of the students awake? Well, um, actually, see, not, not directly from him that I know of. But indirectly, I'm one, one example, because mm-hmm. uh, he was certainly, you know, he wasn't my teacher or anything, but he was on my path. He, he kind of steered me in one direction. He certainly had an influence on me. And um, uh, Andrea, who was his caregiver, uh, who was the first of my students to wake up, but she had, you know, her background, she lived with him for, uh, I don't know, five years, something, uh, intensely in his presence. And he certainly you know, had an effect on her and stuff. And I know there are other people now, every once in a while I run across something on the net, a website about somebody who's awakened, 
uh, and was reading Franklin's books. Usually he's reading the books now, he's dead. Now, I don't know if he actually knew him in person. But, uh, you know, his, well, like you, his, his words, they have an echo, you know, they're beyond the grave, so to speak, and they still can touch people. And perhaps even more powerfully, in a certain sense, um, uh, now, that first, first of all, you've got to realize when he was uh, teaching and in his prime, you know, this was in the uh, 30s, 40s, 50s, 60s. Uh, this was before the, the, the sort of the great spiritual awakening in our culture that happened starting around the 60s, you know. So a lot less people were open to even uh, considering what he was talking about. Right. Uh, so anyway... Um, I'll tell you one story about him, though, because uh, he does have a special place, I know, in your heart and certainly in my heart. And um, but it, I think it's uh, worth the story about not about his teachings, but about him. So, as I said, he was about 96 years old. Uh, he um, he smoked uh, Paul Malls, a pack and a half of Paul Malls a day. Uh, at, in the evening, he would have a couple glasses of port uh, for medicinal reasons, he say. Uh, to help him sleep and stuff like that. He'd wear these three-piece suits with a, a tie, but, you know, the the because he smoked, the ash would drip on them. They all had these little burn holes. He couldn't see them anymore. He, was, <laughs> uh, you know, it, he could still see. He wasn't blind, but he had to read, like, the Time magazine with the huge print and all that. Uh, anyway, uh, so this... Um, so that I'm just trying to give you an idea of what he looked like. And then one uh, weekend... Uh, this uh, kid showed up, you know, young 20s probably, uh, and he'd uh, hitchhiked all the way from the East Coast someplace. He'd, he found, he'd been reading uh, uh, Yogi's book, um, Pathways Through to Space, which is a kind of a diary of his awakening, which is much more accessible, by the way, than uh, philosophy and experience and the other books. And uh, and then he, and he didn't know that uh, Dr. Wolf was still alive, but he found out and so he just got on the road and he hitched like with a knapsack and all that. We didn't have any phones up there uh, at the, where Dr. Wolf was. And this was before, you know, cell phones and stuff. So um, the only way you could really communicate, you either showed up in person or sent a letter. But anyway, he showed up uh, like on a Friday, Thursday, Friday. And he was so excited to meet the great man. And <clears throat> I met him as when he first showed up and uh, Andrea was there and she gave him Oh, she found a place for him to, uh, there's a little trailer or something she put him up in for the weekend. And I, uh, I had just been, had dinner with them and I said goodbye and I went down to my cabin and I was already in a, a place in my book where I was really working intensely. So I didn't come back for the whole weekend. I just was in my cabin. And then the last day, it was a Sunday, I came back and, uh, we had this Sunday meeting where, as I said before, he played these, uh, old tapes of his, and then we talked. And then afterwards, there'd be an informal uh, kind of a, a brunch sort of thing. Uh, Andrea would cook up some spaghetti and salad and stuff like that. And there were usually at these meetings, oh, in the summertime, at the height of the meetings, there might be a dozen people or so, but often just six or seven. Anyway, uh, and then not all of them would stay for brunch. So uh, it was mid-afternoon, and the young man had... Uh, he'd been there now three or four days, and I said, and he was on his way back. He was packed up, and he's ready to go, and he's having this last meal with us, and we're sitting around the table, and the, uh, the young man was saying how disappointed he was because he had come here to, to uh, you know, to be in the presence of this great sage, and all he found was a broken-down old man, you know, who, who couldn't, you know, hardly talk anymore. And, oh, this was so disappointing. He, he thought he was going to find the enlightened, you know, uh, uh, I don't know, uh, guru of the ages or whatever. Well, we were kind of horrified. Dr. Wolf was sitting there right there in front of him. You know, he's talking this way about Dr. Wolf. And uh, Andrea and, and other students started getting really upset with him, saying, how can you talk this way about him? And don't, and they started defending him and this and that. And, you know, I was kind of upset too. And then I looked over at Dr. Wolf See, it, we're not on TV, so you just have to imagine this like a radio show. And he was sitting there with his head cocked with kind of a curious look on his face, tapping his the, the ash off his cigarette, watching this young man. Not, not a spark of any defensiveness, 
not not a trace of any animosity towards the, the kid, not anything. And you know, there just was no ego there. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. he, he just was kind of curious and interested. And then I realized, you know, the, the teaching is right in front of this kid's nose. I mean, he, he, he can't see it, but this is the teaching. This mm -hmm. is enlightenment. You're looking at it and you don't see it. And that's okay. You've got this image in your mind of what an enlightened teacher is. And you have to go off and follow that image, take you to India or whatever, you know, and whoever you end up with. That's your path. That's, that's your journey and you have to follow it out. But you, 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 you've, you've arrived and you haven't recognized it. So you have to keep going. But the teaching was just anybody else that I know of would have been just had some sign of being upset, trying to defend themselves, you know, to be called a broken down old man uh, mm -hmm. to his face. Oh, anyway, it was marvelous. Uh, mm -hmm. A marvelous teaching for me. Wow. So that's if, uh, just in case somebody out there is interested in what kind of what he was like as a person and how uh, his personality it, itself was a teaching. Right. Right. Oh yeah, yeah. I could uh, I could imagine the scene definitely. You're you're the first person. Are you the first? Yeah, I think you're the first person that I've actually talked with who met Merrill Wolf. So I really appreciate that. Well, I'm glad to share it because uh, I've got, uh, you know, as I said, wonderful memories of him and he was so important in my life. Uh, last two questions. Sure. Uh, quick questions. Uh, obviously, you have a background in Hollywood and movies and I always ask liking, <laughs> or I always ask people if there's uh, any films that they would recommend that they think uh, perhaps capture some of the some flavor of enlightenment or the spiritual path mm, ah good question uh, i'm i'm scanning my memory banks at the moment here mm -hmm. nothing nothing jumps out at me i'll tell you that uh nothing jumps out at me um off the top of my head and i don't uh, i look to movies now for entertainment. <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, I don't even, I'm not even, when I was younger, I was very interested in, you know, art movies and, and the artistry of movies and all that. And Oh, yeah. Uh, in, in my old age now, after a, a hard day's work at the at the uh, computer, you know, working on the book, trying to, trying to express something that's inexpressible, that's the hardest thing to do. Uh, at the end of the day, you know, I want to flip on, a, a, you know, an old, some entertaining film, The Godfather. It's one of my favorites. Mm -hmm. Well, that's that's partly because I grew up in an Italian neighborhood, so it's I have the, the Godfather actually arouses a kind of this cultural nostalgia in me. But uh, yeah, uh, yeah, I can't I can't think of one. Uh, I'm okay. sure I'm sure that uh, after the we hang up here, it'll come to me. But uh, <laughs> maybe if I do, I'll I'll. Uh, I'll uh, Ask Tom to text text you or something. Yeah, sure, sure. I can always do you, do add you have that a, in. Do you have a, a favorite spiritual film? Well, uh, a part of the reason I ask is that I do. Uh, what is certainly it? Uh, American Beauty uh, is oh. one of my one of my favorite films in terms of capturing some of the sense of the other, or that there's something other than just human beings here. Oh right, okay. Um, that's that's probably one of my favorites. But I I have the I have the feeling that you know my favorite films are actually all from the late nineties, early two thousands, and I I really haven't <laughs> I haven't seen anything in years that that I thought was a, a really deep impactful film. Uh, I've seen a lot of great well made films. And very entertaining films, but nothing that really impacted me in, in a number of years. I, I agree with you, actually. Um, uh, even just at the you know entertainment level, I mean, I know what you're talking about, uh, deep, impactful films rather than just light entertainment. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, yeah, you know, come to think of it, uh, I, well, I, you know, first of all, you and I are getting older. This happens to older people, you know. 
Oh, they don't make them like they used to. <laughs> right. <laughs> and uh, But also, I think there is maybe some truth that the, you know, there's uh, compared to, uh, well, the the uh, 80s and 90s and earlier, in those days, there were basically, as you remember, three broadcast channels on television and some, you know, local stations. And today with the internet, there's all this uh, uh, time available, you know? I mean... Yeah. And and there's this and it's twenty four seven, and there's this demand for product. I'm slipping back into Hollywood uh, lingo here. Demand for product, and so they just start cranking this stuff out, and you know, as fast as they can. And to me, the the quality is just, you know, slowly over the last decade has dropped and dropped and dropped. You know, I very rarely do uh, do I see some of this really grabbing. I guess Downton Abbey was the last thing on television that, you know, that kind of thing that I saw. Mm -hmm. It was, you know, at least somewhat gripping. And, um, but, um, so I do think maybe it's a, uh, a question of market forces at work and whatnot. And, and, you know, as we all know, when we get older, the culture is going to the dogs. <laughs> <laughs> Always. Yeah, and always. the, and the young people. What's up with and, these kids? I read I read something from Egypt five thousand years ago, or something from a papyrus of this old guy complaining about the young generation is <laughs> no longer following the good old ways and stuff. I laughed and laughed. <laughs> okay, uh, last question: If if someone wants to learn more about you or the or the practices and so forth at the center. What, other than just saying, well, go to the website, is there a particular um, a book or something that would serve as an introduction? Yes, I think Way of Selflessness is uh, the introduction. It was written as a, a practice manual uh, for my students. And in fact, the way our uh, um, programs are set up now, our practitioners groups, we have, we start off, People who want to join a practitioners group, we ask them to do a, a foundation studies for a year. That's like meeting once a week. And the, the text for that is, is uh, the way of selflessness. So that is sort of the introduction to basically everything we teach at the center. And then our different teachers branch out from that. They don't always just teach that book. They teach, oh, other, you know, uh, Lakamatara Sutra or... Uh, Buddhist books or Sufi books, Rumi's popular, and um, but uh, the background is the way of selflessness. So uh, that that's probably what I would recommend. By the way, let me say this because uh, you might not be aware of it, and we have a distance studies program. So someone who who uh, wants to study with a center teacher won't be me because I, as I said, I don't do the the on hands on teaching anymore except for on Sundays. But um, the and and do a foundation studies group. Uh, it's a, like a foundation studies. It's in phases. You can go at your own pace, so it's not like once a week. And uh, if you're interested in that, you can check that out. That's on our website too. So that's something else uh, that's available. Um, so you don't have to be in Eugene, Oregon, to actually uh, study here. Got it. And I'll make sure that I link to the website as well in the show notes. Well, right. that's uh, that's all I've got, Joel. It's, it's really been a pleasure, and I thank you again for taking the time to do this. Oh, it's been my pleasure as well, and uh, I'm I'm delighted to. I really was. This, uh, <laughs> it was a, uh, we had fun. Yeah, definitely. Thank you for listening to this edition of Journals of Spiritual Discovery. I'm your host, Sean Nevins. For more information about today's guest, as well as more interviews, books, and other resources, go to spiritualteachers.org. That's spiritualteachers.org.